When Elsie Robinson moved to San Francisco with her son early in the 20th century, she wasn't planning to change the world. She started a children's column out of desperation because, as a single mother with an asthmatic son, she needed money. But Elsie ended up doing more than simply providing for herself and her son. She ended up changing America forever. Elsie Robinson changed the American newspaper business by becoming America's most read woman, crossing frontiers on women in the workplace and being hired by William Randolph Hearst when the newspaper business was male-dominated. Because Robinson used her position to influence her readers and change their opinions, she is an important pioneer who pushed frontiers for women in the workplace and fought for equal rights for all races and genders. Elsie grew up in a frontier town called Benicia, California. Her family stayed away from the saloons and bars on the west side of town, going to Sunday school and wearing conservative Victorian clothes. Elsie summed up her family as nice people in her autobiography. Although Elsie's older siblings went to college, her family fell into financial trouble and could not send Elsie to school. Instead of college, Elsie did what was expected of a young lady from a family of nice people in the early 1900s. She married a wealthy East Coaster. Christy B. Crowell proposed after knowing Elsie for a few months, but his parents had reservations about the outspoken 19-year-old from California. Elsie was sent to finishing school in 1902 before marrying Crowell in 1903. Elsie's marriage to Crowell coincided with a time when women had no right to divorce, keep their wages, or secure equal pay, topics she would later write about in her columns. In her autobiography, Elsie wrote, Women had few more rights, and hardly as much value, as a good Jersey cow. Wives could be legally beaten, could be thrown out penniless if they refused any of a husband's rights. Elsie also said she was furiously enraged by things that didn't bother anyone else, meaning that in addition to not being happy with the rights she had as a housewife, Elsie was keenly aware of other injustices in society. During Elsie's marriage, the Victorian era came to an end and the changes that came during the Progressive Era, including the ongoing fight for greater rights for women, showed no signs of stopping. Organizations were founded to help women earn political recognition and power, but they were limited. Even though women earned the right to vote in 1920, only the white upper class would enjoy the new freedom. Later in her life, Elsie would write about racial barriers and equal rights for all races, but during her marriage, writing served as an escape. Crowell was never loving or talkative with Elsie, him being 10 years older than her. The only good thing Elsie got out of her marriage was her son, George, who was born with severe asthma and was prone to coughing fits. Elsie found a respite in writing and even published some of her writing in 1911. After being hired to illustrate a few children's books the following year, Elsie gained the courage to leave her husband and move back to California in 1912. Elsie and Christy officially divorced in 1917. Elsie moved to San Francisco in 1918 to find work. She desperately needed a job. George and Elsie often went to bed hungry, and George needed medicine for his asthma. Whenever Elsie looked in the paper for work wanted advertisements, she saw Young Women Wanted or Organized Girls Wanted for jobs as servants, bookkeepers, and domestic workers. Instead of working as a young, organized woman, Elsie walked into the office of the Oakland Tribune and suggested she start a children's column. Elsie brought in a sample of her writing the next day and was offered a contract to start a column titled Aunt Elsie's Magazine. In her letter introducing herself to the children, she wrote, I will write you a letter, all your very own, that will make you know that my arm is around you and that I love you very much. Children could write to Elsie with stories to be published, questions seeking advice, or drawings to be entered in competitions. Elsie influenced the lives of the children she wrote to and became a source of inspiration to them. Aunt Elsie clubs sprang up throughout California with members receiving a pin and getting to ride in parades. While Elsie didn't believe in hammering and morals, she still encouraged children to be their best. One young boy wrote a poem demonstrating this perfectly. When I was reading your letter, I thought and thought again, and I thought I could do better, and so I tried again. Elsie had the effect of a wise woman to look up to, and she was a positive figure in the lives of children. Because Elsie influenced children so much, parents started writing to Elsie. Elsie's publisher allowed her to start advice columns, her most successful being Cry on Geraldine's Shoulder. The advice was mostly for women on makeup, men, and cleaning. Over time, the questions sent in became more and more controversial, such as women in the workplace or divorce. Elsie wrote to one woman, If a married woman has a talent to contribute to the world, she should not be made to linger at the kitchen sink, peeling spuds and hiding her light under a bushel, as it were. She has a right to develop her own individuality if it takes her out of the home to do it. Elsie's straightforward style drew attention from the San Francisco Call and its publisher, William Randolph Hearst. Hearst's love of truth made him a target for threats, but it also made Elsie Robinson appealing to the San Francisco Call. Hearst contacted Elsie in 1923, 
offering her a yearly salary of about $5,000, equivalent to $85,000 today. Elsie accepted and started Tell It to Elsie, the call's version of Cry on Geraldine's Shoulder. Elsie also started Listen World, her most influential and controversial column sharing her views against sexism, racism, and anti-Semitism. Arthur Brisbane, a close friend of Hearst, saw Elsie's column and invited her to Manhattan. Brisbane ran the Evening Journal, one of Hearst's popular East Coast papers with about a million readers. At this time, it was reported that one in four Americans read a Hearst paper, and millions more read his syndicates. Brisbane offered Elsie a yearly salary of $20,000, equivalent to $335,000 today, to publish her columns in the Evening Journal. Elsie accepted. At the height of her career, Elsie had over 20 million readers and was the highest paid woman in Hearst's paper empire. Elsie influenced millions of adults by making her readers think about what they accepted as normal. For example, when confronted about her choice to become a working mother, she wrote, Of your mother, do you think she would have been a wiser guide if she had taken a more active part in the outside world? Elsie used arguments her readers could identify with, in this case challenging a mother's role. Elsie argued that if a mother's part is to guide, she must know the world she is guiding her children through. Elsie conditioned her readers for the coming feminist movement. When a woman wrote in venting her frustrations that advertisements for women were focused on men, saying things like, buy this for your man, Elsie wrote back, I've belonged to, lived with, and written for our female sex for nigh on a 51 years, lady. I started in when we rated mighty low as domestic chattels, and I saw the bright dawning of our so-called emancipation. Elsie argued that although women had earned more rights, they kept turning back to their appearance and seeking approval from their man. Elsie continued, The big idea in the average female's life today is exactly what it was a hundred, a thousand, and a hundred thousand years ago. It is a man. Her one objective is getting that man. Her one big fear is losing him. Elsie encouraged her readers to find their worth in things other than men. She used her columns to spread feminist ideas, something relatively new for her time. Though the women's rights movement started years earlier and the feminist movement was still to come, Elsie played an important role in earning equality. Alison Gilbert, the co-author of Elsie Robinson's biography, writes, Nearly 50 years before Betty Friedan first mentioned the problem that has no name, Elsie Robinson gave a voice to a generation of women who had none. Elsie provided the type of voice that inspired Betty Friedan. Robinson and Friedan both were discontent with their situations, so both wrote about it and were met with a support that trailblazed frontiers. Even by today's standards, Elsie was incredibly influential. The total number of current New York Times subscribers is just over 9 million people, meaning Elsie had more than double the readers of one of the most prominent modern American papers. Elsie pushed against people who wanted to silence her, often writing angry letters to her bosses demanding equal pay. She repeatedly challenged the views of others on issues such as racism, writing in her columns, and on what, may I ask, do you base your supremacy? You could have put aside ignorance, prejudice, and contemptible snootiness and given your lives for unity, but you weren't big enough. You weren't brave enough. With a wide influence, Elsie faced criticism as well. Even other columnists made light of her. One man wrote an opinionated article then told readers who didn't agree with him to go cry on Geraldine's shoulder elsewhere in the paper. He was making fun of the column in general, something Elsie faced frequently. Elsie kept her promise to publish any hate mail she received, showing her tenacity in that she wasn't afraid of what others thought of her writing or opinions. Her logical arguments and bold words attracted enough people to make her America's most read woman, publishing over 9,000 columns in 40 years. Through her revolutionary writing, Elsie brought about significant change. Elsie was the first female columnist to write about her views on social norms. She was also the first columnist to write her stories and draw her cartoons, something still rare today. In 1940, a woman wrote a column about Elsie with an autographed letter from Elsie herself. The author writes, This woman, who has helped through her writings to ease the heartaches of others, found that in helping others, she was finding herself. While finding herself, Elsie managed to change the lives of over 20 million others, making her an important pioneer. Elsie Robinson overcame many obstacles in her life and encouraged others, especially women, to overcome their trials and advocate for social equality. Elsie's national influence is inspirational because she rose from adversity, and to all willing to search it out, she is remembered as a notable pioneer who pushed the frontiers of women in the workplace and equal rights. Through her writing, she continues to encourage others to live up to their full potential, overcome their troubles, and engage in the struggle for justice and equity, starting with you and me.